Uh, thank you, Sally. Um, first of all, it's an honor to be here today and to talk to you. And really, I think, uh, I think we've heard about the criticality, the importance of really decarbonizing our society as a whole. And certainly, as an automotive industry, as an automotive company, we certainly endorse that vision of decarbonization. And it's one that certainly General Motors has been doing certainly over the last decade. And in fact, Mary Barra, uh, who's our CEO, in fact, is a member of the board here at Stanford and absolutely endorses and lives that vision. So what I wanted to do today was to give you um, a little taste of some of the things that are happening within the industry and within GM that is supporting that. And actually, as Sally said as well, is when we think of transportation, we think of the mobile transportation, but actually this industry, again, is a manufacturing industry. So I want to talk a little bit too about what's happening on the manufacturing side. But before we look to the present and, and the uh, future, I just want to use this one slide. And I use this to basically show what can be done. Because again, you hear a lot of people saying, well, we can't do this. There's always tremendous resistance to, to change. And if you actually go back and look what happened with regard to noxious emissions, and by that I'm talking about carbon monoxide, I'm talking about NOx, I'm talking about hydrocarbons, and certainly coming out of Europe, when I grew up in Europe, when, when you looked at the smog in the cities of Belfast and Dublin and London, I was there during that time and I saw that. And now you look at how clean the environment is here, Europe, and actually we're cleaning up the environment in China as well and in other countries around the world. And all of that happened, and I would say really for the students here, um, when you start thinking about change, you think about change happening and it's a large organization, it's a large amount of people. But this change happened actually with a very small number of people because if you go back to 1970, Ed Cole actually ran General Motors. GM had 60% market share, so they could really decide what was happening. They decided to do it, if it happened, if they didn't, didn't happen. Uh, he stood up in Congress in 1970 and said, okay, we will abide by the Clean Air Act that's being proposed, but we, we need lead-free fuel. We have to convert all of our engines, we need lead-free fuel, and we'll introduce a catalytic converter. In one year, the government basically mandated lead-free fuel. So again, if we, if we work together, we can make that happen, and we can make it happen quickly. But 71, we basically converted all of our engines. We had lead-free fuel introduced into the marketplace, Canada, North America. And between 1974, when we introduced the catalytic converter, to today, we've reduced the emissions, the noxious emissions, by about 99.5%. Now think about that. If I was in my position at that time, I would have said that would be impossible. I would say that it would be exorbitant from a cost perspective. I would say that you would change the whole utility of the car. And I'd also say that you sure as heck wouldn't be burning fuel. Well, look at what happened and look at what had been achieved. And also what I'd say and what I'm very proud of is that the catalytic converter was actually developed within my lab. Obviously, I wasn't there then, but by a small group of researchers. And that small group of researchers changed the world. Well, today, we now have similar challenges, to, uh, challenges and actually even, I would say, more demanding challenges. Because when we looked at noxious emissions, it was about the catalytic converter, it was about air fuel control, et cetera. Now we're looking at CO2. How can we get dramatic, dramatic reductions in CO2? How can we get dramatic reductions and improvements around safety? 33,000 people every year die on our roads, 50,000 in China, 100,000 in India. How do we prevent those? And the answer is we can, and we need to go after them. What about congestion? All of the other features that we look about around transportation. And what you're gonna find and what you'll see here is we're in a transformation right now. Mary Barra uh, will say that the next five years you will see more change than you saw in the last 50 years. I completely support that and given all that we are doing in the research side and implementation, that is not a weak statement at all. That is a very, very strong statement. And again, so we're in this transformation in the next five to 10 years is gonna be absolutely astonishing. So again, let me, let me start talking about some of them. 
First of all, um, if you actually want to read this in detail, we do have a sustainability report that we put out each year. Uh, it's several hundred pages. I actually read it coming here on the plane. And uh, I, I would highly recommend that it'll tell you everything that we're working on, cradle to grave with respect to what we're doing from a sustainability perspective. So again, go on the GM website. This is, this is open to anyone. And again, I, I, you will find again that it's very, very comprehensive. But let me give you a couple of examples, and I want to start on the manufacturing side. But a couple of examples, you know, we have about 350 facilities around the world. We have about a quarter of a million people that work for General Motors, uh, and we sell in about 140 countries. So again, we, we, we really touch everywhere in the world and, and can have an impact there. First of all, land-free facilities. We are driving towards all of our facilities being land-free. And we're currently at 90 for our manufacturing operations and 41 for our non-manufacturing operations. And you, you can see, again, this is not just in North America, but this is around the world. And we want to continue to drive to get all of our facilities to be land-free. Um, EPA actually has us as a partner of the year um, between 2013, from 2013, 14, 15, 16. And again, this is their highest accolade um, that they, they can give, again, that's looking at energy management within corporations. So again, we're very pleased with this. In fact, 73 of our plants have the EPA Energy Star, which is showing that they're getting a reduction in energy over a five-year period, typically of 10%. But clearly, we, we really go after getting a lot more than that. But again, we're getting recognized for reducing energy within our plants around the world. And we're also actually, um, we're on the Dow Jones Sustainability Index. Uh, we've been named on that for the last two years. Uh, for that North American index, uh, actually we're the only automotive supplier that's on that index and is recognized on it. And again, that's really a benchmark for corporate sustainability as well. So again, this is, this is about sustainability of what we do, looking at social aspects, looking at economic aspects, and of course, looking at the environmental side. Let me talk about one of the plants, Lansing Delta Township. It's one of our largest plants. It produces our large SUVs for Buick, for Cadillac, for, um, for, or for Chevrolet. And again, this actually has the EPA Energy Star certification which again is the first plant to receive this. It also has the LEED Gold certification. And while it's one thing about doing LEED for an office facility or even a small manufacturing facility, this is a large facility making about 250,000 vehicles, 290,000 vehicles. So again, when you think about actually the effort that goes in to actually make this, and this was the first LEED facility for, actually the first in the world with respect to a automotive manufacturing plant. Something, again, we're very proud of and something that we're pushing more and more. Solar power installations. Again, as we look at reducing energy, and I'll talk about what we've achieved here over the, over the last number of years, but solar power, we're using extensive solar power installations. Think of the plant. Think of the opportunity for solar power within the plant. Remember these 350 facilities around the world. By the way, if you have good ideas, we'll try them out as well. So, I heard some of those this morning that uh, I'm looking forward to hearing. But again, 22 facilities producing 48 megawatts of power and growing by the day. Wind power, we're using extensive use of wind power within our plants. Mexico, you can see here, we, are, we have about 34 megawatts. In Texas, actually our Arlington plant, where all of our large SUVs come out of, Ar or actually out of Arlington, again, about half the energy is coming from solar power, about 30 megawatts. And actually, this is an example, we could, spend, we could spend a whole lecture here talking about what do we do with batteries? What do we do with basically batteries after end of life within the vehicles? And what you're seeing here is one example that we have. This is our enterprise data warehouse that was built out in Milford. We have three of those in the world. And again, this is all, where all of our data is stored. And I think most of you know when you have a data warehouse, they are energy hogs. Uh, this one got LEED certification, by the way. It's the top 5% from an energy perspective of all data warehouses. And what you're seeing here is that actually 
we have, we're, we're using used volt batteries to store electricity, both from solar and from wind, to operate this facility. The great thing about these batteries, when it's end of life for the vehicle, they still have about 80% of the storage capacity remaining in those batteries. So there's a tremendous opportunity in a secondary market um, uh, for these as we again ramp up with electrification. Bottom line, again, we talked about the whole vision around decarbonization of the auto industry and we firmly are going after that as General Motors and pushing it again for the auto industry as a whole. By 2050, we want all of our 350 facilities, 50, 59 countries around the world to be 100% renewable energy. And if you look at what we've achieved so far, um, looking from 2005 to 15, we've taken about 43% of the CO2 out of looking at it from a CO2 per vehicle perspective. In fact, we're producing a lot more vehicles now. We produce about 9.9 .9 million vehicles. And from 1990, we've taken 60% of the CO2 out of our plants from, again, a CO2 per vehicle perspective. But again, we're not finished, and we need to keep pushing and pushing, since again, this is a high energy intensive industry when you look at it even from a manufacturing perspective and not from the, from the mobile side. But clearly, again, we need to look cradle to grave for all of these as we look at CO2. So let me touch now on, on some of the key drivers for the mobile side of the business. Those 9.9 .9 million vehicles, the 250 million vehicles that you see that are right there in the vehicle park today in North America. And you can talk, I can talk a lot about what, you know, basically what are all the key drivers. And of course, a lot of those drivers are conflicting. It's a highly regulated industry, of course. If you look at it from an emission and CO2 perspective, 90% of all of our vehicles around the world are highly regulated today, and rightfully so. And we'll continue to be highly regulated, and we'll continue to push again to improve those vehicles, both from an emission standpoint and, again, from an environmental standpoint. Technology is exploding, and, and technology capability, and I'll talk a little bit about that. We gotta look at the economics of all of this. You, know, you can't just add technology to vehicles. It's the second biggest purchase people have today. When you look at 140 countries, if we're gonna solve the CO2 problem, it's not with high cost solutions. We have to find solutions again that we can scale across all of those countries. Uh, urbanization is impacting us significantly. I'll talk a little bit more about that. And then energy, um, of course, we need diversity in our supply. We need low carbon energy and again, um, that's something, again, that is at the forefront of our business because whatever happens in the energy side has a huge impact, of course, to us. Um, the regulatory requirements, again, I could go into a lot of detail on these, but I'll just, the simple chart is we're driving, again, we have a fuel economy requirement for our fleet of vehicles of 54 and a half miles per gallon for 2025. That's 58 in Europe for 2020. And again, these are not the end game, but these are gates that we go through and continue to improve. And actually the most stringent one from my perspective is the 56 that you see in China for 2020. Primarily because we have a high percentage of diesel in Europe supporting the 58, and of course virtually no diesel in China. So again, um, significant challenges and challenges that the industry will um, drive for, and again, surpass as we go through these these time periods as well. The other big one that's changing us actually, and I'll be talking about this, is you know, customer expectations around their digital life. Everyone now has a digital life, uh, and our newer generations ha are completely connected to the internet. People want to bring that digital life into their vehicle. They want to expand that digital life, and again, that's going to have an impact on everything, including energy, and I'll talk about that in a little bit of detail. Connected living, if you look at connected living, these are, these are the mega trends that, that we're watching very closely and how it impacts us. Seven billion cellular subscriptions, more than the number of people on earth, to, you know, to put it into perspective. Three billion uses of the internet. Um, I think there's about 100 hours um, uploaded of movies basically onto the internet every minute. And uh, my two daughters can attest to that. Uh, Facebook, 1.4 billion active users. 90% of the world's data has been created in the last two years. Think about that, 90% in the last two years. And again, a significant amount of data is being generated 
with our vehicle fleets. I'm going to talk about that in a little bit of detail. Urban mobility, you know, we surpassed 50% of the population living in, in urban settings, and that's continuing to grow as we move forward. We're seeing the growth of mega cities and of hyper cities. How do we move people within, within those dense populations? Again, significant uh, impact to our business. Global youth, again, very different mindset. A mindset that's moving away from ownership to access. As long as we can have access to transportation, that's what we're looking for, access to mobility. Again, changing our business significantly. But don't forget the aging. One side we have the millennials, the other side we have the aging population. It's growing in a lot of the countries. And again, it's not, aging is not what it used to be. People are active. They want to have freedom of transportation as long as they live. And how do we make sure that happens? So let me talk about some of the mega trends that we have that are driving and supporting those societal megatrends. First of all, it's all about efficiency. Efficiency of the propulsion systems, efficiency of the vehicle. I'll talk about the mixed material strategy for the vehicle, but the one thing's for sure, we are gonna have conventional gasoline engines or liquid-fueled engines and transmissions for a very long time. We'll electrify those, some of them will electrify heavily, and then we'll have all electrified vehicles as well. But for those of you working on biofuels or liquid fuels, we have to decarbonize the liquid fuels because they're going to be there for a long, long time. Uh, we're doing a lot to improve the efficiency of those. Um, downsizing, you're seeing you know, virtually most engines now go into turbocharged and downsizing. I'll show that a little bit uh, as we move forward. Variable valve trains, again, a lot of sophistication, a lot of technology being put into much smaller engines to make them much more efficient. Multi-speed transmissions, six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10-speed automatic, CVTs, DCTs, etc. Stop start is really rolling out across the world. Why have an engine running when the vehicle is stopped? And then e-assist is light electrification, the order of maybe 15 kilowatts. So you hear about heavily electrified vehicles, but light electrification will have a significant impact as we look at CO2, as we look again at those 140 countries that you sell in across the world. Clearly, full electrification of the vehicle, plug-in hybrids, extended range electric vehicles, and of course, what you're seeing now with the Bolt, with the full electric, and you're gonna see more and more growth of electrification. Uh, next year, I would say by 2017, we'll have produced about half a million, what I would call electrified vehicles. Those vehicles that are highly electrified, plug-ins or full electric. The light weighting strategy, don't forget there's a lot we can do there. And it's all around a mixed material strategy. First, there's the fundamentals, the use sort of the efficient fundamentals. Really look at removing material where you can, light, you know, light weighting where you can, right sizing the vehicle, looking at topology optimization. And that's driving costs down. And then you can add more and more premium uh, materials to try to control the cost. Because again, you want to put this out in scale. You just don't want it in your luxury vehicles. And you, here you'll see some of the lightweight material innovations that are in products today. Bottom here is probably, I would say, in the more premium vehicles. But on the top, again, the DNA has changed to press hardened steel. So again, a lot of work has gone on in steel, aluminum, magnesium and also carbon fiber. But it's not going to be a one material solution, it's a mixed material solution. So as much of an issue as the material is, how do you join those materials? How do I join carbon fiber to steel? How do I join you know, aluminum to steel or to magnesium? Those are all the challenges we're gonna have. Let me talk about one of our new vehicles, top of the line Cadillac CT6. You know, again, has got every technology in it. Again, it's a luxury vehicle getting 37 miles per gallon. This is a plug-in hybrid vehicle, uh, and it's top of the line luxury. So again, 37 miles per gallon. You'll see basically that, it, again, it has a, an all-new two-motor electric drive on the rear, and on the front, basically a conventional engine, a three-liter engine on the front. Lots of luxury features, and what you'll see is, again, the plug-in hybrid and aluminum-intensive architecture. In fact, it's using about 11 different materials to really drive the mass down. And we've taken about 300 pounds out of this compared to what it would have been an all-steel design. But it's okay to do it for the CT6. How do you scale that to across your fleet? The Malibu, 47 miles per gallon on the new, Mal or sort of new Malibu hybrid electric vehicle. And by the way, this is the vehicle that needs to get to 55. So when you think about 55 miles per gallon, this is the type of vehicle that needs to be there 
as we talk about what we need to do for 2025. We're at 47, again, all electric up to 55 miles per hour. And again, what you're seeing, it is a, hybrid, a full hybrid electric vehicle with a lot of light weighting done, again, through different materials um, that were added. So again, it's very much, you'll hear people talking about this mixed material strategy, put the right material in the right place to do the right function. The Volt, um, we're now on a second generation Volt, just introduced 53 miles, all electric, and again, 500 miles, basically full capability with the engine. And then of course the Bolt, we brought the Bolt out, 238 miles range on the Bolt, uh, going to production as we speak. And again, so this is, this is going to have a significant impact, I believe, as a game changer as we think about electrification. $30,000 vehicle with 240 miles all electric range. Lots of complexity as we look at the battery systems on this, as we look at the power electronics, as we look at the motors, etc. And it is all about the batteries. What is happening with battery technology? Tremendous amount of research ongoing. We're now scaling up batteries. And really it's all about how do we get to about 400 watt hours per kilogram? The Volt was about 140. Uh, the Bolt is probably about 250. And we gotta get to 400. That's what I'm putting all my effort on. Get to there and above. And to do it very cost effectively. As you can see, DOE target around $100 per kilowatt hour. It's doable and we have to do it. But think about where you have a Volt at 140 versus 400. The opportunities are endless, much more range or much smaller size, much smaller or lower cost. Lots of technology being developed, rightfully so. And um, we gotta continue doing that from a research perspective. Uh, my lab, I have people in China, I've got people in North America. I have identical facilities in both locations, putting every effort into developing the battery technology for the future. I'll finish with, as we talk about cradle to grave on the vehicle, or this part of it, there's a very good, um, this is a report put out by Argon, but it was done by a number of companies. It was done with US Drive. So it was with DOE, it was NREL, it was EPRI, a number of the fuel companies, a number of the OEMs. This is a very extensive report that looks or cradle to grave, looks at all of the fuels, looks at what we can do as we really want to reduce CO2 in, in the fleet. So I'd highly encourage you to take a look at that. And then I want to talk about another area which doesn't impact us directly, but is impact or from an energy perspective, but is really driving the industry significantly. And that's connectivity of the, of, of the vehicles. Back in 96, we actually introduced OnStar. Uh, we got about 12 million users. Um, I think we've had about 1.2 billion interactions with the users since we introduced it. But we've connected the vehicle, and then more recently we've added 4G, and so significant 4G capability across, we got about three and a half million units out there already with, with the hotspot capability. So now we have this big pipe that we have going back to the cloud, going back to the internet. What can you use it for? Um, we've introduced basically Android Auto and Apple CarPlay across, across many of our products this year, 2016. We've also done prognostics. Won't dwell on this, but I'm very proud of it because my team worked on this and developed it. And rather than having diagnostics on the vehicle, would it not be nicer to be able to predict the future? We, are now, we now have vehicles in production that will contact you if your battery is going to die in the next month, if your starter is going to break in the next month, if your fuel system is going to break in the next month. So you'll never be stranded. You'll know ahead of time. And so this is about prognostics, and you're going to see more and more of that. And it's all about data. That's all about analytics. Also, you're going to see the merger of vehicle intelligence with connectivity. And it's all driving towards cars that don't crash. I mentioned the 33,000 units, or 33,000 people that die every year. A lot of that can be prevented. Most of those fatalities can be prevented. And that's what we have to go after as well. Vehicles that don't crash, vehicles that drive themselves. This is a roadmap that shows where we're going from driver alerts to emergency intervention. You're seeing those on vehicles today to limited on-demand driving in the highway, et cetera, which we're doing with Super Cruise introducing to, again, full autonomous operation. Super Cruise is limited autonomous automated driving on the highway. We're introducing this as we, well, shortly, I would say, the next months. Um, on the CT6. So again, this, this will give people the capability of going hands-free. You still have to be alert, you still gotta be watching, 
But again, on the left-hand side, you'll see the active safety. You'll see what we have on our vehicles today. Look, vehicles today have about 100 million lines of code. They have about 70, 80, 90 you know, you know, ECUs on the vehicle. Now we've got, on production today, we've got six radars, we've got ultrasonic sensors, we've got cameras, etc. And that's just gone up exponentially as we go to Super Cruise and beyond. Uh, next year, we'll introduce V2V communications, dedicated short-range communications. This is a single technology that's going to save many, many lives, but we've got to be able to scale it up. We're working with the government on that. And then finally, where I see the whole transformation occurring is, as you think about not any of these in isolation, but if I think about shared, first of all, the shared economy, I think about the connected economy, and then I think about the enablers of electrified and autonomous. Connectivity, again, people are now connected to their vehicle. So we've connected them to their digital lives. We have CarPlay, Android, and we're also looking now at transportation as a service. So again, it's back to having access, it's back to having a service. And this shared transportation is growing and growing dramatically. You've seen the growth of Uber. We've invested in Lyft, it's growing dramatically here in North America. We have Maven, which is our brand, where today, in fact, this has now been introduced in California, where again, you can now go and get access to vehicles. You can get an express drive that just takes you to the airport. You can get a vehicle for several hours, several days. And again, this is the Maven brand. We're working with Lyft as well and supporting Lyft and ultimately going to an on-demand transportation system that ultimately will be fully automated. So this is transforming the industry and it's the connectivity of all four of these. It's about connected, it's about electric, it's about shared, it's about autonomous. Some of you may be aware of the acquisition we had of Cruise. Some of you may have seen our vehicles here. We currently have the autonomous vehicles driving here in San Francisco. We're continuing to develop those. And really the first application of these, these vehicles will be with the likes of Lyft, with the likes of Uber, with Maven, where again, that now you have these robo-type taxis operating in geo-fenced areas. Ultimately, we want to take that and scale it so that we will have those vehicles available for personal transportation that people can buy and put in their garage and drive anywhere. That's ultimately the vision for the future. So I'll end by saying that we're, if you look at what's happening here, we're spanning everything from personal ownership to really the on-demand multimodal transportation systems. So you're seeing these new systems being developed, you're seeing them being implemented, and it's happening very, very rapidly. And why do I say that, that this can impact energy? Because now when you think, if I have automated systems, how does that impact congestion? Can I reduce or eliminate congestion? What about parking? When you look at a lot of those hypercities today, megacities and hypercities, most of the fuel is actually driving around looking for parking. Now with this on-demand connected transportation system, then the whole vision for the future is very, very different. But I would say that it requires all of us working together. In the past, it was the automakers introducing technology. Now this is a huge ecosystem. We have to look at local government, state government. We have to look at the NGOs. We have to look at the insurance companies. We have to look at the intelligent transportation systems that we can put out there. It's a huge ecosystem that has to work together because the enabling technologies are happening and happening rapidly. Now we've got to create the right vision for transportation for the future to make sure that we take full advantage of these enabling technologies. So with that, I'll end and be happy to answer any questions. Hi, my name is uh, Ronnie Bargata. I'm the CEO of Genesis LLC, a local company here in Silicon Valley. We developed a solar amplifier um, in conjunction with a photovoltaic cell that reduces or eliminates um, um, lithium ion batteries uh, for stationary applications. Our first uh, beta site is in Africa. It's part of the big electrification program. My question to you is, um, does General Motors consider a solar amplification technology as viable for mobile applications? We're certainly open to any of the technologies. And you know, certainly we, we see solar as becoming more and more dominant. 
We're looking, obviously, I talked about solar and what we're doing with our plants. And we're looking at potential operation on the vehicle as well. Now, now that we have the highly electrified vehicles, there's different opportunities that we're going after. So what I would say is we have, I have a facility here in Silicon Valley. Frankie James, or Frankie James is the director. And the function we have here is going out and talking to people like you. So please see me afterwards and I will give you my card and connect you with the team here. But certainly we are, we're, we're looking for every opportunity to improve the efficiency of the vehicles. And I would say, the one thing I would say, if you go back four or five years ago, let's go back pre-bankruptcy, because that was not a nice time, but, but you had, the companies were resistant to change. What you're going to find now is the companies are not resistant to change. What I tell people is, the ideas that you were afraid to talk to me about, please talk to me about, because that's what I want to be working on. I spend a lot of my time here in Silicon Valley, we have a facility here, and a lot of that has gone out to scout these type of ideas. Hi, uh, Trip Allen of Energy New. With the more complicated vehicles of the future, how will today's uh, vehicle recycling infrastructure deal with it when we start seeing lithium ion batteries going into auto shredders? Yeah, um, very good point. And there's a lot of legislation around recycling. And if you look at this from a CO2 perspective, in fact, if you go into the Argon you know, study, you'll actually see how much of, you know, when we look at the CO2 footprint of the vehicle, how much of it is manufacturing, the recycling, et cetera, it has to be done there. Um, you're seeing, you know, you have legislation in Europe today about recycling. You're, you will see legislation, more legislation here. So this is a huge issue, and it's an integral part of the business. You have to have solutions. You know, we, we are in our infancy with lithium ion, of course. But we are working diligently to look at what will we do with respect to recycling it because we haven't had the quantity of it that we will have 10 years from now, 15 years from now. So big deal. We're working hard on it. And that's why, first of all, the secondary use makes a lot of sense, getting more value out of it. But we still have to look at the recycling because it's pretty limited today what it's used for. It's being used in the construction industry, et cetera. But I think no one's ever really looked at it seriously from a scalability perspective of what, what it is now, not as a problem, but an opportunity. Um, you gave some numbers for the fuel efficiency standards uh, that you project for new cars, but if you look at 2050, does anybody know what the requirement is for the average, not the new cars, but the average fuel efficiency that's needed to reduce the, the, uh, fuel, the, the greenhouse gases to a level that's compatible with all the other users? Well, I think a good indication of that is the ZEV mandate that we have here in California. Uh, and if you look at what we're looking, you know, we're looking to reduce 80% CO2 by 2050. Um, the calculations would show that um, certainly by 2025, we would have to be putting out a significant portion of new vehicles, probably about one in seven, uh, of our new vehicles would have to be either a ZEV or a PHEV, right? So highly electrified here in California. By 2050, the fleet of vehicles, not the new vehicles, but the fleet of vehicles running in 2050, 87% of those would have to be ZEVs to be able to meet that, that standard. So the one thing that, and again, you'll see it in the Argonne report, but one thing you can look at, you can look at what we can do from a light weighting, an arrow, et cetera, and you know, we can get, certainly we can improve CO2, but if we're going after the 80%, we have to go after the decarbonization of the fuel. That's, that's critical to us. And the good thing is, you know, the thing I like about electric vehicles is as we green the grid, the electric vehicle has a, a lower and lower carbon footprint even after it's been introduced. So typically you don't see that with a vehicle because you don't see it with the liquid fuels. But we've got to be looking again, cradle to grave, but certainly those standards are very, obviously very, very aggressive. But as I said at the start, when I looked at what we went after, basically with noxious emissions, you know, we have to work together collaborative or collaboratively to actually make it happen. Because one of the things that frustrates me is when I look at noxious emissions, the, the OEMs fought the government every step of the way. 
And yet they made it every time, so there'd be, there'd be a new standard, a new standard, and everyone's, well, we can't meet that, well, we can't meet that, well, we did, and we did, and we did. So you're always seen as part of the problem. I think you should be part of the solution. We've got to work together on this. We have to make this happen, and you're seeing within the industry, and certainly I can say for GM, a very strong commitment to make this happen. But as I say, 87% of the fleet to be ZEVs in 2050 is a, is a very, very tall order. So we've got to work hard to see what, what other alternatives there are to. Thanks a lot for the talk. So I'm curious why you believe that we're going to be needing gas and other liquid fuels for a long, long time when you were also talking about vehicle electrification and from the estimates that I've heard, uh, electric vehicles should reach cost parity with internal combustion engines by 2022. Yeah, I think, I think what, you know, certainly what you're seeing with uh, liquid fueled engines. Again, think about it. We're selling them across the world. We're selling them in 140 countries. So CO2 is not a national problem. It's a global problem. And so certainly we're doing everything to drive down batteries. But now you, you look at you know, people who are towing. People are looking at larger vehicles. So it depends on the utility of the vehicle. If it's, if it's driving in an urban setting, it may be very suited to a electric vehicle, all electric. Um, certainly the technology is getting better and better. Um, we're also developing fuel cells, which I didn't talk about. The fuel cells again, and as Sally talked about, fuel cells give us the opportunity of going into the larger vehicles, whether it's small buses, et cetera, et cetera. So, so there's no, it's not, to me, it's gonna be a strategy where for quite a while, you're gonna have a portfolio of solutions. You know, people, these, these investments are billions of dollars whenever, whenever you do new engine programs, et cetera. So there's an installed base out there that we can continue to improve upon, but at the same time develop the alternatives. And as the alternatives get better, and then they're economically viable, at the end of the day, the customer then decides. And that's, that's where you want it to be. Um, I would say back 14 years ago, I was arguing basically about fuel cells because everyone said fuel cells was the answer. And the answer is no, it's a diversified portfolio that fuel cell was part of the answer. So we gotta be very careful that we don't sort of say, hey, there's one solution. We need to be developing alternative solutions. And ultimately, the market, the consumer, the regulations in place will probably drive us towards one versus another of those solutions. But again, what we see is, you know, if you think about today, uh, liquid engines, gasoline engines have break if, if I look at their efficiency, they're probably running in the 30% range. You know, we have opportunities to take that up dramatically into the mid-40s, into the you know, 50% range. So again, the, the liquid-fueled engines still have an opportunity of improving dramatically, and we've got to be investing in that. We've got to be investing in electrification. We've got to be investing in hydrogen. And then we've got to look at how do we scale that both in the North Americas, the, the Chinas, the Japans, the Europe's of the world, and then also the developing nations as well. Okay, I'm going to take the last question. Um, so, so going back to what uh, Laurent Tuviana said earlier, that you know, COP21 sort of was a tipping point in the views amongst world leaders that this is, uh, you know, climate change is something we have to address, that, that it was possible that we could all make the contributions that were consistent with our, uh, you know, own vision of success and so forth. And as I listen to you and I think about the auto industry and, you know, as a, as a citizen here in this country, I mean, I, I would tell you it's fair to say that the American auto industry was not viewed as terribly innovative and that, that they were resistant to change. And, but I listened to you and it's a completely different picture. Like what happened? What, how, did you get, how did you go from there to where you are today? Was it technology? Was it a leader? Was it a belief system? What, what was it? Um, I, think, I think it's a combination of things, but I, I think Again, if you look at what the industry has done, 
and not really got the appreciation for. And, and again, I talked about the noxious emissions, and no one really understood that. If you said to people, how much of the emissions do you take out of a vehicle? No one would say 99. Some people might say 50, 60. Um, if you look at what's happened from a safety perspective, you know, we have been leading, and certain GM has led in safety for, you know, from the 50s. And when you look at the technologies that have been introduced with airbags, et cetera, et cetera, there has been a huge amount of technology developed and introduced and not recognized. And that's, that's what I'm saying. I think that, it's, to me, it's a case of we understand what has to be done. We need to look out far enough into the future to go after those grand challenges and figure out how to do them. But we have to do them in an economical way. Right? Because at the end of the day, if it's not, you're out of business, we haven't fixed the problem. So I, I think it's a combination of a number of things. I think you have, you know, again, you were looking at a North American market. We now look very much at a global market. Certainly, I know within our company, we've put much more focus as well with the customer, understanding what the customer wants, needs, what their aspirations are, and how do we meet those? Because also, at the end of the day, the customer buys the vehicle. We can put a vehicle out there, and if the customer doesn't buy it, it doesn't help. So I think it's, it's, a, it's a combination, but I think when you look at what we've done even within, you know, the, the energy savings within the plants has saved money. And that's the best way to get energy savings is actually to be able to do it and benefit from it. So I, I think more and more people are looking much more holistically at this and what we need to do and go after those challenges. Well, thank you, and, and I really did appreciate you spending a little bit of time talking about manufacturing, because when we invited you, I was thinking you were going to right. talk about the second part, but, and, but I'm delighted that you, know, you point out that this is a very you know, energy-intensive industry, materials-intensive industry, and that you guys are, are working so hard on that side, too, is really encouraging. So thank you very much for a fabulous talk. Thank, thank you. you.